See, uh, as of last week, we have entered the real where we are. So we are like a, a compound or assembly of five things, of five components. Uh, we start with the form. Let me sort of a refresh it for you. The form, which is the physical form or material form, we call that the body. Okay, the form of the body. That's the first part that it is very obvious and tangible. The second group, this group we collectively call the mind. In Pali, you can call it nama. The first group we call rupa. Rupa is a form. And nama is the mind. Or name, okay? Nama actually means name. So the name of the mind is made up of four parts. The most important part is what we call consciousness. So when we have this mind, it means that we are conscious of not only ourselves, but on, of things around us. That's what makes us different than or this bottle or this clock or this book. Because the book is not conscious of things, or the, the clock is not, but we are conscious of that. So the first part, it's like a major theme, central theme of this mind, to be conscious, or consciousness. The second part we call feeling or vetana, okay, feeling. We can feel things, feel something pleasant, something unpleasant sometimes, feel kind of neutral or indifference. The third part we call perception. This perception actually include part of memory. Because in order to perceive things, we must recognize them from our own old experience. For example, if we say this is a piece of paper, how do you know it is a paper? Someone told me in the, in the past. Okay, so we recollect and recognize that as a paper from past experience, okay? But if we haven't seen it before, just like a Martian walked out in front of us and we said, who is this, what is this? Then we said, no. Yeah. So we make up a name for it. So all of this is just, just want to remind you, this is just a name that we make up of all things, okay? So perception, and the last one we call sankara, which is mental formation. The way that we make thought, idea, concept, okay? And that's what makes us kind of what we call homo sapien. We know how to think. We know how to create things. We know how to imagine, okay? That's what we are. We are homo sapien, sapien, that's what. We call ourselves. So these four parts, consciousness, feeling, perception, and mental formation, that's what make up the part we call the mind. In Pali, rupa is a form. Consciousness in vinyana. We just shared about the last thing, the last section that we shared, okay? Vinyana is consciousness, vedana is feeling. Perception is sanya. And the last one, sankara, is mental or mind formation. So those five parts, okay, when you look at things, earlier you told me something about interesting thing. You drove here and someone tailgate you and you feel kind of, a, you know, uneasy about it, okay? You didn't like it because someone tailgating that. And I think everybody does that, right? If someone tailgate you and you, you're driving 70 miles per hour and it was just three feet behind you, <laughs> you're not gonna like that. So this kind of feeling, it arises, okay? And when it becomes unpleasant, can you tell yourself that, oh, this is real pleasant. Someone was tailgating me, I'm real. Can you do that? Of course not, okay? So. It's beyond your control in that way, isn't it? Okay, if someone come in and throw a rock at you, what happened to you? It hurts. Mm -hmm. Can you tell that, wow, this is real pleasant, I like it. Would you tell that? Would you say that? It can, right? 
because it's against what the nature of thing. So when something like this happen, it actually beyond your control, right? So another thing is that you know, if you love someone dearly, and that someone should be separated from you, taken away from you. So what happened to you? Your heart just broken, okay? And you said, whoa, I'm so delightful. Can you do that? No, you can't, okay? So it's beyond your control. You have no control over this thing that changed behind you. You're getting old every minute, do you know that? <laughs> I think everybody realized that, right? Every year we're getting old, okay? And you said, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to get old, okay? And right now, there's a lot of oak pollens out there. And for someone who's really, really allergic to that, you suffer and say, oh, I'm not suffering from this at all. You know, I don't have all this runny nose and coughing and itchy eyes and all kind of stuff. You cannot do that either. So what I'm trying to tell you is that all this form, all this feeling, all this thought about losing someone and you make it, can you make it different than the way it has been? Or it happened? You have. You cannot. So it's beyond your control. Right then and there. That's what the Buddha asked his disciple. This is a second sermon that the Buddha gave to the five ascetics. Five days after he gave the first one, he gave the first one, you remember? Dhamma Chakkapa Vatana Sutta. The discourse of turning the wheel of the truth in motion. That is the first sermon that he gave the five ascetics. And only one of those five ascetics saw the truth. Out of these five, only one. Okay? Five days later, he said, well, let me give them another lecture. This is what he gave them. He said, we know that this being that's sitting here, all of us here, made up of these five parts, is the form is really under your control? Can you tell them, I don't want to get old, I don't want to get sick, I don't want to die? Can you tell them that? No. So it's beyond under control beyond your control, right, the form. What about your feeling? Just like I said, if someone hit you with four by four, you say, oh yeah, really pleasant. Can you do that? You can. But aren't our feelings within our control? It's not. As soon as someone stick the knife at you, what would you feel? Emotions, I'm thinking about. No. Feelings. Even the emotional, I will tell you that later, okay? If someone, Either, that is body feeling. Emotion is a mental feeling, is it? Okay. So, when you have this mental feeling, if someone, you walk along this 192, someone just drove by and took your purse, you said, yeah, thank you. Would you do that? You so gleefully enjoy, enjoy it, what happened. That's emotion, right? Right in the way, you become so angry, right? Everything's turned... Well, so everything that even happened like that, if it happened with your feeling, with your thought, with your perception, so on and so forth, it's beyond your control, isn't it? When it happened, and you can't have no control of that. And that is what the concept of what we call not a selfhood. It's not you. You have no idea, your control over it because you have, cannot make it the way that you want it to be. Someone hit you, it hurt, but you cannot tell that it is pleasant, can you? So how can you say that is a selfhood inside there? Okay, this is what we call the concept of not self. Natta. This went back, go when, if you want to go back, this went back way before the Buddha came on earth. 
What happens then? You know, remember one time I was telling you that there are two kinds of belief in our world. One is belief in eternal life. The other group belief in eternal death. What does it mean, eternal life? This group of people believe that. There is a real thing we call a soul, a self. In Pali, it's called Atta. In Sanskrit, it's called Atman. There's a real thing, a real soul that occupy in this body. Okay? And this real soul or real self, as soon as this body decay and die, what happens to this? It will reincarnate in the next body. And eventually, this Atman, there's two kind of belief, Brahmanism and uh, Upanishad. They believe it's a little bit different, but the same way that this thing will eventually will join the great Atman, the great self, that is a great Brahma God, and stay in, in heaven forever. So that is eternal life. So it means that sooner or later, this self is going to go up there somewhere and join the real self, the great self, the big self. And some of our religious belief, nowadays we have that, do we? Right? Joy the great God, isn't it? Supreme God. And that's what we have. Right? And has been in this world for so long. Everyone agree that? Okay? We've seen that, okay? That is eternal life, belief. The second one we call eternal death. This group said, no, once you're dead, you're dead. This, there's no such a thing as a self or soul. They are gone. One you bury it six feet under or you cremate them, nothing. There's nothing left. There's no soul, nothing left. No self, no atta left. That's we call eternal death. So, would you have any kind of moral responsibility in this group at all? If I do something wrong right now, I won't be responsible forever. If I die, I die. I'm gone. So I can do anything as I please. Right? Ah, see, that's what the Buddha came along and said, well, it doesn't make sense, is it? There's a lot of flaws in here. So people will have no moral responsibility if they said, if there's nothing in here after I die, nothing left. I don't have to pay back. I'm not, I don't have to be accountable for anything. That is not a kind of belief. And people still believe that, even nowadays. That's why they can go on spree of killing and do all kind of things because yeah, after I die, I'm, I don't have to be accountable for it. Some people do believe that, okay? And that's the reason why we have a lot of problems in our world too. Because you don't have to be accountable for your own act. You, if you're dead, you're dead. That's it, okay? So both of these theories of disbelief has some flaw. Even the first one, because if you have a real self, okay, and you keep living, up, you, you will keep reincarnate to the next one, the next one, the next one, but still, you are part of the great self up there. Eventually, you will be joining them no matter what. That's what they believe also. The Buddha came along and said, look, things arise because there is something caused them to arise. Just look around you, okay? So he just tell us, anything that come up here that arise in our world must have cause for make them arise. And when it arise, they become the cause of some other things to arise after that. But that's what he wanted us to think about and prove that and see that, okay? So that is the reason why he has a concept of what we call 
the law of conditionality. Being conditioned. For example, okay, how you grow up to be a person at this age, at this size, at this shape? Because your father and your mother have to get together, right? It's being conditioned by two persons, two people come together. And after you are born, and if you don't eat, drink, or s nourish this body, would you be staying alive just like this? So you are conditioned by what? By food that you eat in, right? That's a condition caused by, because of. And the world is just like that. Would this building be sitting here if someone has no intention to build it? So now it's, it's because of something. That's why something arises. If someone, if this morning you came here, if there is no one tailgate you, would you have those unpleasant feeling? No. Ah. So as soon as someone tailgate you, you have unpleasant feeling because someone was tailgating me. Ah. So everything happened because there's something happened before that. That is the way of our world. That is dependent origination theory. Just a brief thing that I'll just tell you, okay? Cause, effect. And that's what moral law is based on. You do good, you get good. You do evil, that's what you get. That's what the horse is teaching based on this. So now let's get back to this self, not self. You have no control of what have, ever happened to these five things that make up you. And he asks you again, these five things that happen to you here, are they ever long-lasting, stable, never change? Your form constantly change, right? What about your feeling every minute? What about your perception all the time? Your thought. How many times you have your thought change? You change your mind all the time, right? Your consciousness changes also. Your awareness changes every second. You wear this, you hear this, you're aware of that, you smell this, you're aware of this. So all these five things constantly change. It comes and it gone. Isn't it? So is there anything that really permanent about these five components of your being? First, it's not really yours because you have no control of it. Now, it is impermanent. Can you see that? This thing that constantly changes does is produce joy and happiness or produce stress and pain? Answer yourself. Today you feel good. Tomorrow you go see a doctor and doctor said you have a bad problem. That's normal change in life. You're happy now, five minutes later you feel sad because you hear something from someone that bad news happened. The world, two days ago what, that thing that hit the earth, okay. asteroid, okay? I think they just missed, uh, I think people in California saw that, they missed they, they saw the whole thing just past them. No, it just, if the path of the Earth, the orbit, it just shift a little bit and may hit California. Okay. So that's what happened. It happened just like this. 
even in the greatest of our as trauma, as, astronomical uh, thing from the universe all the way down to this each cell of your body, they constantly change, right? They die and replace with a new cell. So now, can you come up with these three things that we just talked about? Thing and not really you. Have no selfhood. They constantly change and they become stressful and unbearable at times. Is that what characteristic of who we are? Impermanent, because we were born and we will die. And along the way, we constantly change. We are being oppressed by old age, sickness, and death. So does that make us happy or unhappy? Yes. That's right. So that's what these three characteristics we're talking about today. Okay? They are impermanent. They are suffering or painful, unbearable, and they have, we have no control over it. That is not a self, not a soul, because that is not permanent. So remember these three words, anicca, it means impermanent, dukkha, it means they are stressful, suffering, painful, and the third one, anatta, not under your control. Yeah? Since we do not have a soul, what is it that maintains our, the memory of our personal God? The mind. The mind. the mind. Yeah, we have a body and a mind. We don't use the term soul because the soul only represents a permanent entity. Okay? The mind is not permanent. So what is the soul? The soul is, is something that they believe that occupy this body, just like the mind, but they are permanent. But what is it? We don't know. It's just like a mind. The thing that makes you think the thing that make you do things, make you feel, that's what they call the soul. But they are permanent. It is what is it? It is permanent. Is, is there anything permanent in yourself? No. So how could be a soul? Well, what I'm trying to understand Yeah, is that's what I'm... Right, because, yeah, once you die, just like your body here, become part of the earth. And you, the part of the earth, that becomes the next person, isn't it? Where do you grow from? How do you grow to be a person like you are? From what makes up the earth. That's right. Because you eat things from food, the food from earth, isn't it? Everything comes from earth. Whatever you eat this morning, this, the past, whatever years you, you have, it came from the earth. All the animals, all the vegetables, where did it come from? from here. That's right. So those earth that keep recycle. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's right. <laughs> which came first, the chicken or the egg? You, you answer that. <laughs> okay. You understand now? Because there's nothing that permanent this way. The thing can keep on way changing, and the next one is not going to be the same as the, the falling one. The falling one is not going to be the same as the preceding one. But in the theory of soul, they are permanent in the way that if you are what you are, the next one is going to be just like you are. Isn't it? Just like, what's your name again? Chris, okay. Last life, were you Chris? No. Next life, will you be Chris? No. 
Oh, how come? Because there's no memory of... Because there's, it's always changed. Then. So if you are a permanent thing, you're going to always be Chris, isn't it? Well, I, I think my question is in the context of the life of Buddha. Yeah. Eventually he transcended his karma and he was not reborn. Okay, that is going to be a different thing. Okay, because that's what the, the homework I'm going to ask you to do. Things was born and they will die. What makes things from dying to be born again? That's what I don't understand. Right. I think it's semantics. You say the yeah. word soul. Yeah. It's just a word. Like yeah. you said, it's a book. But I can right. Call it. That is the nerve. The thing is this, when one believes in something that is so permanent in that term, okay, you believe this is a real man, which part do you call a man? The form. What? The form. No. Just make up, just like a stream of the river. What is a stream? No, so stream is just a term that call the collection of molecules of water that passing by all the time, nonstop. And that is what the body and the mind is all about. They constantly change, the form change all the time. The mind change all the time, just like a stream. When it's past, it's no longer the way it was. It's a new thing. That's why it cannot be permanent soul. It's a new thing coming up. Constantly change. Let me see. For example, where is water coming from? The cycle of life. What life? Well, you have moisture in the air. And the okay, it begins with what? It begins with hydrogen and oxygen combined, right? At first, when it's so pure, can you see the molecule of H2O? You cannot, right? But when the temperature and all barometric pressure, all kind of things change, it condensed themselves, combined, it become a fog. Can you see a fog? Ah. Now you start to see the fog, okay? And then the fog condensed themselves, combined, compound together. The temperature changed. What happened? Become a drop of water. Now you can see the drop of water. You can feel a drop of water and become a real substance, okay? That's what you think. And when the water collect together, it becomes the river, go all the way to become an ocean. Now, when the temperature change, what happened to those water? It evaporate. Can you see evaporation? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, right? But when it evaporate, and if there is certain kind of impurities that comes in by that, now you can start to see almost like sometimes even the we use the term smog, which is a combination of pollution and this fog. Become smog, right? Then you can see it clearly. If you don't believe me, go to Los Angeles. Look over the town. Go to uh, uh, yeah, China right now. China is, is real bad uh, pollution. You can't even see Beijing sometime, okay? Because of this smog and fog, Combined with this pollution, that's what makes them become a real thing. But when it gets higher, and it being be dispersed, okay? And if this thing dispersed, become just a pure molecule of H2O, what happened? It does not take up any impurities there. That's when all this defilement separate themselves. That's what transcend all this defilement. Defilement is all about. Separate themselves from all this impurity that has been occupied 
the mind, which is just the energy. Okay, and that is what. That's the reason why I ask you, what make them come together again, and being born again. You know, it die, right? Everything. We all gonna die. After we die, what bring it back to become a human being? Have you thought about that? We always talk about. Chris and I, I think, are the same thing. We yeah. Find some evidence. <laughs> you see, that's what, what evidence is coming from. You see, you're gonna die. That's you believe it? Death. It's a word. I understand. But do you understand? I'm deteriorate. Right. Do you know you're getting old every day? All right. You know that. Do you realize that? No, no, no. See, that is the thing. That's what, not what the Buddha was telling you. That's what you need to see. Okay? You need to see for yourself. And how do you see that? This is the big question that people have been asking. That's what inside meditation is all about. That's the proof that you're looking for. But how are you going to prove that? Okay? Do the way that he just told us. What is the three things that he told us to do? In order to have an insight of who you are. What is, what is it? We talked about that in the past few weeks. Is that about the wisdom, the, um, the purity, and the... No, okay. no. That's right. What else? What else? See? To get a wisdom. Intuitive inside knowledge. That's your wisdom. Once you gain this tree, follow this tree principle that he taught us, that's when you will come up with this. The three, remember the, three, the triple step of practice? You know about it. Sila, Samadhi, and Banya. That's being mindful. And we call it, you have learned. Remember that? Sila, Samadhi, and Banya. Moral precept, meditation, which is actually gathering the power of the mind. Once you gather the power of the mind, then you will be able to use that to penetrate and you get your evidence. No one's going to show you that. No one's going to tell you how much you know. You are the only one that you know how much you know, or you don't know. And that's the reason why practice is the most important part in the teaching of the Buddha. Not just learn all this, or listen to me, or listen to whatever, the tape or whatever. It helps to guide you, so this is the way that I should do. And that's what I've been telling you all along. That's, look, when you sit, what do you do? You cultivate your mindfulness. Because once you do that, it helps you to recall, to keep, to stay close, to keep everything that you're in, interested in close to the mind. So the mind knows. That's what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is what we call mental factor or mental co concomitant jetasik. Sati is born of the mind. The mind is the nature of knowing. And the nature of knowing always changes. That's what the soul in the other tradition is all about. The nature of knowing never remain the same. They constantly change. Okay? So, that's the reason why we don't use the term soul in the teaching of the Buddha. Because there's no such a thing as permanent. They always change. And some of them change in the way that it arises and it's gone. But it will arise again 
we know that it arises and it's gone because it, it's being compiled. It, it's simple. Once you put things together, sooner or later it will break apart, right? That's where they are. But how could they come back again? What is the reason? What is the cause of things to come back again? That is what I told you at the beginning of the hour. That's your homework to find out through your own experience. Because you're not going to find it in the book. You know things arise and it's gone. You can see that. It was morning a few hours ago. It would be night. It's changing, right? So the day is gone, right? The night comes, replace the day. And the day, it will replace the night. The night replaces the day. Winter is going to replace... And you're asking us what causes that? You're going to find out by your own experience. Isn't it is what it is? It no, is there's no, no, no such a thing. There's always something that caused them. No, it's not. Just like this thing, we know this is a concept. We make it as a concept. Things arise and be gone. Okay? Just like this building, it'll be gone. The tree is going to be gone. The temperature like this is going to be gone. All things change because of the way they arise and they end. Is there anything that doesn't end? Is there anything that doesn't end? No. Okay. And how could this ending become another beginning? Intention. I'm sorry? Intention. That's what you need to find out. <laughs> and that's what the homework I want you to do. I'll give you homework to do. Okay. Can you give us a website to go to the find No, there's nothing. <laughs> it comes from your own practice. Okay. You're not going to find that. Okay. You're not going to find that anywhere, right? And this is what the practice is all about. You have to come up with what we call intuition. That's what intuitive knowledge is all about. Each one is going to come up with that, but they will be the same. I was always told you can't find it, Google it. No. <laughs> See, that, that, that is what we call the ignorance of our world, okay? Because that's what they believe in. Okay. That's what they call the soul. The death that we of the world, the person in myself, think as a physical death. But what you're saying is mind and consciousness died as well. They don't. It arises and it ends. Okay? And then it will arise again. That's what the homework I want to give you. Why would it begin again? Why would your consciousness begin again? Why would your feeling begin again? Why would your perception begin again when it ends? After it ends? Because we allow it to, we let it begin again. That's what you need to find out. See? In the two, two lectures from now, the end of the last session, that's what the answer will be. But you can try to find that out, okay? If you don't know, I'll tell you then. But I want you to try to find that out because some people can come up with the answer there. Because things arise. That's the nature of things. Arise and it ends. That's why there's no such thing as permanent. Right? If it's permanent, there's no ending. Isn't it? This is the definition. Right? Well, that's what the worldly talk is about. If you can reach some Dhamma, the ultimate truth, you have to use the worldly talk to get there, isn't it? You know, but so what is the... Words for everything. Why? That's Why right. Trip on the words? Yeah, you know, but what, what is it that make the ending become beginning? If you believe there's no ending, you're okay. Or you know there's no ending. But is there or is there not? I would say no. There's no ending. So, but you're just telling me there is, but I don't believe you. But maybe there okay. is no ending. Things just change. Yeah. Because it arises, it begins, just like you. Are you going to stay like this forever? No. 
Okay, how about this world, this building, the tree, the city of <laughs> Kissimmee? All this around you, is going to stay like this? No. Nothing. So tell me, what is thing that stay the same? So it means that it start, it's be gone, it will end, isn't it? That's why it doesn't stay the same. Maybe it doesn't end, it just, just goes on to something else. Ah, that is what I want you to find out. That is the question that you have to raise. And then find a question, find the answer to that. This is analytical method of learning. See, if I tell you everything, just like you tell your, teach, your student, isn't it? You tell them, as soon as you walk out the classroom, they forgot everything. That's how we learn in our life, isn't it? We learn because we borrowed from other people's idea, text. We never come up with our own. <laughs> and that's what I'm trying to tell you. Because that's what he told us to do. You have to prove for yourself. What do I tell you? Why do you believe in me? Who am I to, to, to make you believe in me? I have my answer. Okay. So that is the reason for this. When he said there's three concepts of this thing, three characteristics of all existence. Conditioned existence, one is impermanent, second, they are stressful, they are unbearable, they are painful sometimes, and the third thing is that they are beyond anybody's control. So those are the three characteristics of a common characteristic of all conditions existing around us, including us. So when you really see that, what's going to happen? Then why should I hold on to this as really, really me? Why should I hold on to this that, you know, it can give me a lot of pleasant thing, a lot of pleasure, a lot of happiness in life because sooner or later that thing keep turning against me do you think you're going to be uh, satisfied with everything in your life all the time sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't but that's the way it is so once you see all this that's when you start become weary of all these conditioned existence. So, Dr. John, are you saying that we should hold on to pleasant or unpleasant things? Is that what you should do? I'm asking you. No, don't ask me. <laughs> Is that what you should do? What happens if you hold on to the pleasant thing? So what then, what happened? Suffer. Right. So if it, is, if it is the thing that unpleasant to you, you're not going to hold on to it anyway. But some people do, right? But then why should we hold on to the pleasant if we're not going to hold on to the unpleasant? Right. And that's what the question that you must ask, ask and then answer that through your own knowledge. Why should I hold on to this thing? Why shouldn't I hold on to that thing? So on and so forth. That is meditation. But in order to do that, you have to start with being mindful of things that arise in your mind. It's not a simple thing that say, you know, I can think about this and I have the answer. That is, That could be a very, very bad mistake that you do in your life because you don't really see the truth behind that and you come to conclusion on your own. When you come to the conclusion, you will believe in that. It means that you perceive things just like when you walk along the, the yard, you see the horse and right away that is a snake because you perceive as a snake. 
right then you think that is snake fill yard so you believe that the whole area is filled with snake so I will never set foot on this area ever again some people do that right you look at people you look at anything you say well you know that's look like this way people look at the cows that eat hay okay so that person believe that hay is good for the body well it's true isn't it we eat steak right where does steak come from from the cow what does a cow eat hay isn't it so hay must be real good that's his conclusion so right then and there you start to eat hay people will have that kind of perception and that kind of thought that kind of belief that is what we call distortion of the mind and that's what we need to really really look at them and see is this really distorted or not could a person live on hay alone no i don't think so <laughs> try it <laughs> no i'm just wondering i don't know if anybody has tried it but you know the cow can do that right yeah and we eat cow gleefully joyfully we eat a lot of steak right and there's a lot of nutritious thing from the steak every people eat it every day hamburger you know, in mcdonald's right in front of you so that's what we believe in is it and they eat only hays so people said man why don't we eat hays the same like a cow whatever you cling to will eventually become unpleasant? No, I didn't say that. No, no, I'm asking. Yeah. The thing is that whatever you cling to, what is, first of all, what is the use of clinging to those ideas, what those thoughts, those feelings, whatever it is. Okay, first of all, you are obsessed with that. Okay, when you cling to that, mm -hmm. that means you really believe in that kind of thing, even your own thought. Okay? So when you cling to those kind of things, if you can't prove whether it's right or wrong, you will follow that idea because you cling to it, okay? So it becomes your idea, your thought, your belief. When you believe in things that you cannot verify, I mean, it cannot be substantiated with facts. Of course, sometimes it can be right. But sometimes it can be wrong. If it's wrong, then it will not be beneficial to you, isn't it? And that's when you're going to find out that, well, you know, I get hurt. That's the reason why before you firmly believe in something, you must prove it. It's like you always say, if you have a met yellow met metal, you think it's all gold? You got to prove it, okay? So that's what the first initial step is, trying to do the thing that he asked us to do. And about a week, don't you, I think we're going to celebrate what we call Ma Bucha. That is the day that the Buddha, 1250 Arahants gather, and the Buddha gave them the first instruction. We call that exaltation to liberation. There are 13 teachings in there. We can, I can ask Sanju Kun to talk about it tomorrow on the Tama talk. Okay? That is the key that we can follow to towards the liberation towards this transcendent uh, of this uh, suffering that's what he taught us he knew the, the official instruction that he gave to the arahan to spread out to all people in the world okay 
And then you may find that why the thing that after it's gone, it, it ends, it will come back to begin again. Why is it recycle? We recycle ourselves all the time. Do we know that? You don't know that? Okay. We eat food from the earth. And then after we eat, what will happen to us? We pass it down, right? Become what? Fertilizer. Oh. Right? Yeah. And that's what we call uh, we call natural fertilizer is all about. Isn't it? Natural food, where does it come from? They use the fertilizer. Where does the fertilizer of nature come from? They don't use a chemical, they don't use a phosphate, they dig it up. There's some bats, the guana from bats, collected all the time. Right? If you go to China, do you know where they have this fertilizer? Anyone been in China? Okay. If you just go out of you know, Beijing or big city, you know, they have an open what we call toilet. So people go in there and either urinate or defecate, okay? And they make a, like a trough, a line. They collect all these feces and this stuff. And they collect, that is, a, this is, that is what they do. And it has been done for thousands of years. Okay? No, even here. When you talk about natural food, do you know where they, they, they get fertilizer from? First of all, from cow dung. Okay? That's healthy, isn't it? Have you eaten them? But I'm saying they, they only eat hay, so they're, they're, not, they're not taking any impurities, right? Right, and that's what they use, isn't it? So that's what feces, that's what the fertilizer, and that's what we eat them. Have you thought about it? You need more time. Tom. Tom. See, he said it, here they do that too. Once they collect all this from the sewer, where do they take those things to? to? Yes. Yeah, they make fertilizer out of the sewer. Don't you know that? That's what ignorance is all about, not knowing, and you believe in. Yeah, that's what, what fertilizer is all about. So we, re, uh, we are recycling everything that we do every single day. He said we recycle the food, we, you know, the paper, we recycle the plastic. But the food that we eat, the thing that we pass on, we recycle that too. Okay? All right? So now let me give you a little trick on how to do this in real practice. Are we ready? Because it's after four now. Are you ready to sit and... and yeah, but that's the way it is. See? See, that, that, that's what... Give me another word. Okay. Because that's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. I believe there's no end. I like that better. There's no end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's just the breath, but we're talking about... Existence. Yeah. And you, you, you continue to exist? <laughs> You're going to be the same, man? I love that word spirit. I love that word spirit. I think that... The spirit. You say soul, but maybe spirit? What about the mind? I like the mind. Okay. They're the same thing. But the thing, have a mind. But the thing is that they're the same thing. But people believe in different aspects of them. When you say the soul, they believe in the permanent aspect of the mind. Are they permanent? I think the soul is in the heart, not in the mind. No, they're the same thing. Okay, it's the nature of knowing. The soul knows, the knows, soul conscious, the thought, all thought or feeling, all this, that's what 
the soul means, but they imply as a permanent thing. That's the reason why we don't use that term, because as soon as people heard the word soul, yeah, I have a permanent soul that will join God one day. Isn't it? That is what people believe in. You go as everywhere. Okay, that's what "atta" it means. As soon as you use that term, that's the reason why people believe in this aspect of permanency. So when the Buddha came along, said, "Look, if there's permanent, why this thing keep changing? Okay, and why things start just like the day, the day continue, never end." The year continue never end. The week continue never end. It all. They say, "Oh, the sun does not shine at night." But yes, it does. It's the sun never goes out. The sun is always shining. That's right. We see dark over here, but it's light over there. So that's right. That's the problem. It's just the word. Okay, but here, can you see the sun? Twelve midnight. No. Okay, so that's why the the day ends at certain time. Okay. It's not the word, but that's the word that makes sense. Because when you have beginning, then you have the end of it. If you have beginning and there's no end, what would happen to it? See, and that's a problem. If they have beginning and there's no end. So would you see any difference? The always beginning. See, that's what we want. Yeah. So are you saying that the only permanence in life would be the cycle in itself? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing is that that thing comes all to always come. Constantly change. The thing is that that thing constantly always constantly change. The quality of that mind or the energy is not the same. Okay. Just. But still, it's those chains. When we become a new one, it will not going to be the same as the old one. That's why the chains always change, also change. Okay, <laughs> the chains also change. The chain itself also change. All right. So, and that's what we're going to try to find out on our own practice. When you sit here, first thing is that you have to gather the power of your mind in one place. That's what we call sati, to be mindful. Get the mind in one place. In order to get that mind in one place, you have to give the mind to work on, to find the object the mind to stay with, so we can use the breath. So how do we do that? We follow the breath. Okay. First, when you breathe in. You know you're breathing in. You breathe out. You know you're breathing out. And then sooner or later, you start to realize or understand the breath. Sometimes it is long. Sometimes it's short. Sometimes it is very coarse, very strong, very powerful. Sometimes it's kind of soft, gentle, and refined. Those are the characteristic of the breath that constantly change, and that's what the mind must stay on, pay attention to. That's what being mindful of the breath. So you keep on breathing. You check the characteristic of the breath. Okay, it's the first thing. So once you check the characteristic of the breath, sooner or later the mind might stray off, start to think about the world outside, whatever problem that you have in the past, whatever. Th- Thing that you want to do in the future will start to pop in your mind. That's what we call hindrance. You need to prevent those hindrance to come in by pay more attention to your breath. So stay with the breath, constantly stay with the breath. Don't allow the mind to stray off somewhere. Sometimes we use the technique of counting. So use counting. You use. Quick counting or slow counting. So you can do it either way. You can wait until the mind stray off and bring it back, or you can 
Use the counting until the mind stay with the breath. And you can control the breath by making long or short by either lengthen your count or shorten your count. Okay? Have you done your counting before? Either one count in, breathe, count one, breathe out, count one, breathe in, count two, breathe out, count two. That is slow counting. And then you can do what we call quick counting. Count from one to five on the in-breath, one to five on the out-breath, and then extend to one to six, one to seven, one to eight, one to nine, one to ten. That's the counting. Will prevent the mind to stray off. And then when the mind stay with the breath, kind of a most of the time, then you can start to use the power of the strong mind to look at a change in the mind itself. Because sooner or later you're gonna have all this either anger, all this craving, all this laziness, all this sleepiness that arise in the mind. When this thing arise, you have to make note of that. By making note, wow, oh, anger has arisen, or craving, or lazy, or feel kind of a daydreaming. Whatever arises in the mind, you must make note of that. So once you do that, you make the mind aware of things that happen. That's what training of mindfulness is all about. If you don't, your mind will be carried away with all those events that are coming along. And by the time you realize it, whatever time that you sit here will be with all those things that happen in your mind, okay? So make sure you know, aware, alert to things that arise in the mind by making note of that. Once you do that, you are able to keep the hindrance at bay. Once you can do that, then the next thing is that you may start to have what we call phenomena. That is, you're gonna feel good, you're gonna feel delight, you're gonna feel, have this joy, you're gonna have all this pleasant feeling, and that's when you're gonna take your mind away from your task, that is stay with your breath. Okay, so this is the first two part for the newcomer, the inexperienced meditator you will have to face. Once you overcome this, then you will go on to the next step. So now, go ahead, get yourself comfortable, keep your body straight, take a few long deep breaths, four or five times, but make sure you are aware of the in-breath and out-breath. How are you gonna be aware of that? by feeling the breath. When you breathe in, feel it from the tip of your nose all the way into your chest, down to your diaphragm. That is pushing your abdominal content out. And then when you breathe out, everything start to contract, deflate. So make sure you understand that because you can feel it for yourself. I'll let you work on this. Maybe you can work on your counting to prevent the mind from straying.
after a while when the mind stay with the breath pretty well I'd like you to start to take note of the change in your body when you breathe in what happened to your body when you breathe out what happened to them Sometimes the breath is long, but not all the times. When the breathing is long, what happened to the body? What about when the breath is short? What happened to the body? So you start to understand the characteristic of your breath. It begins and it will end somewhere on the in-breath and out-breath. And then it begins again. When you take note of that, you breathe in, chest rising, abdomen rising, then it ends. It cannot go any further, can it? Then the out-breath start. Where did it start? What happened to the body on the out-breath? So you notice the rising and falling. You can make note of that. In breath, start at the nose, chest expanding, abdomen is rising, and go no further. You pause a little bit, the out breath start, the chest is contracting, abdomen is falling, the air is leaving your nose. And then the out breath no longer there. You have to start the in breath again. So either one, the in breath and the out breath, cannot go on forever. Can it? It begins, it's no longer there. And then the outbreath start. It's go on and on and on like this. Have you ever wonder why? If you really, really want to take note of your in-breath and out-breath, observe them closely. Things change all the time.
the breath itself demonstrate the appearance of beginning. When it demonstrate the appearance of ending of the in breath. And you keep really observe that. Take note of the thing that changing, fading, decaying of your own breath. Right then and there, if your own breath show these three characteristics, After a while, when the mind pay constant attention to the breath, the five mental hindrances appear less and less. This is where many phenomena of the mind will arise. Because right now, the mind is not concerned about the past, the thing in the outside world. It has the job at hand, that is watching the breath. But sooner or later, following the breath, up and down, up and down become distracted so you can leave the mind at the tip of your nose just keep watching the in breath and the out breath just like the gatekeeper watching something pass in and goes out Very soon, certain phenomena may arise. Satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, It arises automatically. That's the nature of this energy of knowing. That is the mind. It's just the energy that occupied in this form.
make us aware, make us feel, make us perceive, make us think. It's just an energy. It's a psychic energy or non-physical energy. This energy constantly change. There are many terms that we use for this energy. The mind, consciousness, soul, spirit, atta, atman. They're just a term that designate and name this energy that occupy here. Without this energy, this form is a combination of four elements. Basic elements of the water, the earth, the fire, and the wind. Whatever arise, observe it, see how it change. Every single one of them. It is difficult to see the change of the form in terms of arise and fall or beginning and end because it takes a long time for someone to see that. But it's easier to watch and observe the faculty or the factor of this mind, of this energy of knowing. Because the feeling change. Take the body feeling. In the beginning, it may be comfortable, pleasant, to sit this way, but let's sit for a little while longer and see if this pleasant and comfortable feeling remain the same. You start to feel uncomfortable someplace, start to feel itching. Feel warm, feel cool, whatever. That's the way, that's the nature of this form. To have different feeling arise, change, and it ends. And a new feeling take place, 